Back in episode 8, we looked at the rise of Korean civilian resistance to the Japanese invasion, the movement known as the Weebyong, the Righteous Armies. In this episode, we'll be exploring a second guerrilla group that was active throughout the war, the Sungbyong, monk soldiers. That's coming up. As always, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Get on board the Imjin War train. And if you're already on board, thank you. Joseon Dynasty Korea was the only state in the history of the world to adopt Neo-Confucianism as its state ideology. So, what was Neo-Confucianism? It was a revival, starting around the 10th century AD, of the ancient teachings of Confucius and the Chinese classics, a reinterpretation of this ancient wisdom into a philosophical system for ordering society and guiding human conduct. In Chosun Dynasty Korea, if you wanted to become a government official, you had to have a deep understanding of this Neo-Confucian philosophy, and you had to appear to live by its precepts as a virtuous man. It was a bit like the situation in a fundamentalist Islamic country today, where mullahs study the Quran and use its teachings for guidance. For a Chosun Dynasty government official, the writings of Neo-Confucian thinkers like Chu Shi was his Koran. Okay, now you might be thinking, but I thought Korea was a Buddhist country. What's this deal about Neo-Confucianism? Well, here's the story. Previously, in the Goryeo Dynasty, Buddhism had indeed been Korea's state ideology. Buddhism flourished in Goryeo Dynasty Korea, and the Buddhist elite had a lot of influence in the government, a lot of power. All that changed in 1392, when a general named Yi song overthrew the Goryeo Dynasty and established a new one, the Chosun Dynasty, with himself as its first king, King Taejo. To secure their power over the country, King Taejo and his successors began to undermine Korea's Buddhist elite, all those powerful Buddhist monks that had had so much influence in the Goryeo government. They were a threat, and so they had to go. For the next 200 years, Buddhism became a persecuted religion in Korea. Buddhist temples were closed. Buddhist property was confiscated. Buddhist buildings and images were destroyed. Buddhist monks had their official status taken away. As far as the Chosun government was concerned, monks were just a bunch of lazy guys who sat around chanting all day and who refused to lead productive lives. The result of all this was that Buddhist monks were driven completely from public life in Korea they were forced to retreat to monasteries hidden deep in the mountains, where the Buddhist faith was kept barely alive. Okay, so now we get to the rise of the monk soldiers, the Sungbyong. The Japanese have just invaded Korea. They're marching north to take Seoul, then Pyongyang, and King Sonjo, he's on the run. He retreats all the way to Weiju on Korea's northern border just one step away from abandoning his kingdom completely. In his utter desperation to raise some kind of resistance, King Sonjo turns to Korea's Buddhist monks. He can't mobilize them himself. After two centuries of persecution, the monk community isn't going to listen to him. So what Sonjo does is he appeals to one particular monk, an aged, venerated monk, named Hyujong, otherwise known as Sosan Desa, great master of the Western Mountain. Hyujong 
had become a monk after failing the civil service exam for a career in government service. He founded a movement to reconcile Neo-Confucianism and Buddhism, and went on to serve successively as the head of Korea's two remaining Buddhist sects, before retiring to his mountain hermitage. Hu Jong was therefore highly respected by monks of both sects, and he was also grudgingly admired by many in the Chosun government for his recognition of Neo-Confucianism. So King Son Jo appeals to Hu Jong for help, and Hu Jong, he agrees to call Korea's Buddhist monks to arms. Why? Well, to begin with, joining the fight against the Japanese would be a way for the monk community to show its patriotism and value to the country and hopefully earn it greater recognition and acceptance by the state. Hu Jong also owed King Son Jo a personal favor. Three years before, he had been falsely accused of instigating a rebellion and would have been thrown in prison if Son Jo hadn't intervened. In appealing to Hu Jong for help, King Son Jo was calling in this favor that he now expected to be repaid. On June 16, 1592, about two months into the war, Hu Jong issued a proclamation calling upon all able-bodied monks to leave their monasteries and rise up against the Japanese. More than 8,000 monks answered this call to arms, rallying to regional Buddhist leaders. They never amounted to a large force, but they were highly disciplined and extremely courageous. In the coming months, they would more than prove their worth. The monk soldiers saw their first action on September 6, 1592, when a unit under the command of the monk general Yonggyu combined forces with Weibyong civilian fighters to retake the town of Chongju in the central province of Chungcheong. They then moved on to Kumsan on the northern border of Chola. At this point, there was a falling out among the Koreans. The Weibyong leader, Cho Hun, was so angered by the provincial governor's report on the retaking of Chonju, which scarcely mentioned Cho's contribution, that he charged ahead and attacked Kumsan alone. As we saw in episode 8, Cho and his entire Weibyong force, the so-called 700 martyrs, were wiped out. The monk general Yonggyu was so moved by Cho's self-sacrifice that he in turn charged in to attack the Japanese fort with his monk soldiers, and he too was killed. These repeated attacks on Kumsan were costly for the Koreans, but they did serve a purpose. They made the Japanese very cautious about entering Chola, Korea's breadbasket province. Monk soldiers would continue to play a significant role in civilian resistance going into 1593. More than 4,000 of them would participate in the retaking of Pyongyang in early February, as depicted in this monumental painting that hangs in the War Memorial Museum in Seoul. That's Hu Jong on the left, arm raised, commanding his monk forces in the attack on the hilltop temple complex on Morambong, a Japanese-held stronghold guarding the approaches to Pyongyang. In fighting that lasted two days and two nights, more than 600 of Hu Jong's monks would be killed, but they drove the Japanese out. Their actions cleared the way for the main army to advance on Pyongyang and retake the city. In the interwar years, between 1593 and the second Japanese invasion in 1597, Monk soldiers would play a major role in building and strengthening fortifications throughout Korea. The Chosun government had promised that any monk putting in one year of this service would be allowed to apply for official monk certification after the war, a restoration of their former respected status. Thousands of monks therefore started building walls. In the end, however, 
few of them ever got the certification they'd been promised. The government imposed so many restrictions and made the process so difficult that it became almost impossible to get. And so the monks retreated once again to their mountain monasteries for another few centuries to await the modern era when Buddhism would finally be set free in Korea. I guess I got a little ahead of myself in this episode, mentioning the retaking of Pyongyang, because that came after China entered the war. So we'd better get into it. It's time to take a look at the slow awakening of Ming China and the dispatch of the first Chinese troops to Korea. Stay tuned. <laughs> 